Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. And today we are doing our 10 question series. We're coming to the end. And this is the Cold War, the USSR, Russia. We're back in the USSR from 1953 to the present. Uh, as Bob Dylan once said, a hard rains are going to fall. So warfare in the Cold War meant it couldn't be in Europe. Because if it was in Europe, everybody dies. Nuke, the nukes blow up everything. Everybody gets nuked. You have... Uh, you probably haven't seen war games, but I saw war games when I was a kid. Uh, everybody gets nuked. Everybody loses. It's the, the day after tomorrow. Everybody dies. So they can't, the United States and the Soviet Union cannot fight each other. We've already talked about that. And they cannot fight in Europe. American troops and Soviet troops cannot shoot at each other, and they definitely can't shoot at each other in Europe. So what happens is, the United States and the Soviet Union fight everywhere else, whether they do it themselves or they use proxies. They use other people. They give people weapons. And in the 1950s, the United States is in Korea. The USSR is putting down Eastern European uprisings. In the 1960s, both the U.S. and the USSR are funding civil wars in Africa. They're funding different sides of the Arab-Israeli conflict. The U.S. is in Vietnam. In the 1970s, Central American civil wars. Woo! The Soviet Union and the United States are funding different sides as they murder each other and tear their countries apart. Uh, there's the coup in Chile, for example. In the 19, late 1970s and early 1980s is uh, the USSR in Afghanistan. So the U.S. in Vietnam is reversed. So the U.S. in Vietnam, the Soviet Union gave the Vietnamese lots of weapons. In the 1980s, if you've seen the Tom Hanks movie, Charlie Wilson's War, the United States gave the Afghanis, the Mujahideen, lots of weapons. So it's... It's not that the United States is peaceful, and it's not that the Soviet Union is peaceful. There's war all the time during the Cold War, but they can't fight each other. Khrushchev and de-Stalinization. What did it mean? Well, Stalin died. And if you've seen the movie like Death of Stalin, where Jason Isaacs plays miraculously, awesomely plays General Zhukov, Field Marshal Zhukov, you see that a power struggle ensues and Khrushchev wins. And he wins through an alliance with the reformers and the army, Zhukov, via Marshal Zhukov, who's the great, who's, he, who's responsible for killing more Nazis than any other person. He is the general who stopped the Nazi march on Moscow, turned it back, led the counter-assault and led the conquest of Berlin. Zhukov um, is the victorious general versus the Nazis. And uh, he's probably the most famous man in, in the Soviet Union next to Stalin. So, like, this is why Stalin doesn't get rid of him. He can't. You know, um, one of the Louis, Louis XIV, I think is reported to have said you cannot arrest Voltaire. Like they're just too famous. They're too important. If you're arrest, it's the, it's the McCarthy hearings, right? When McCarthy, when Joseph McCarthy accused Hollywood of communists, people were like, oh my God, there are communists. There are Jews and communists in Hollywood. Yes, and he said, ah, oh, and there's they're in the government, and people said yes, and he said, and they're in the army. Those people who defeated the Nazis are also communists, and people went, what? Are you effing insane? They're in the station in Germany right now, waiting to nuke the, the Russians, waiting to nuke the commies. They defeated the Nazis. What, what, McCarthy, what are you doing? And that was the end of, that was the end of Joseph McCarthy. Because he had gone too far. You couldn't do it. No one would believe it. 
Here's the thing, though. When Stalin died, they began the process of de-Stalinization. And it started with the secret speech in 1953, which laid out the terribleness of Stalin. See, most people didn't know. And even then, it's not going to get out. Like, foreigners didn't know just how terrible Stalin was. The Nazis told people how terrible, how the, the, how the Soviets were murdering mass numbers of Poles and Lithuanians by finding the graves and being like, see, you think we're bad. Look at the Russians. Look at the Soviets. But Khrushchev lays this out. The gulags, the murders, the mass deaths, death, the mass rapes. He lays this out. Not for everybody. It's not in the newspaper posted for everybody. But it begins the idea that the Soviet Union must change. We can't do this. It has to be more liberal. We must compete with the United States, both economically, but also morally. Because look at the United States. They got problems. Look at how they treat their black folk in the South. Look at how they treat their Spanish folk in the Southwest. Look at how they treat their immigrants. Look at how they treat their women. The United States is not morally superior. They say, um, and justice for all. And then their jails are full of black folk. And they say all men are created equal. And then black folk can't vote. Native people can't vote. And even if they can vote, they don't give them a polling place to vote at. So for Khrushchev, there's like, all right, we had Stalin. We won the war. We have an empire. Now we have to change. People should want to be communists. We have no racism. We're pro-feminism. We are better than I as a philosophy, which is true. And you go, wait a minute. No, it's not. It's like, what have you been learning on Sundays ever since you were a kid? Your neighbors, you want to be treated, right? That we is better than I. It's the basis of community. It's the basis of Christianity and Judaism and Islam. It's the basis of Western enlightenment. The idea that it's, it's Star Trek for God's sakes. The fate of the many is more important than the fate of the one, right? It's Star Trek two, the wrath of Khan. It's Spock being logical. It's, it's not even emotional. It's logic. The lives of the many are more important than the individual. The we is better than the I. And communism has that, at least philosophically. Don't, you know, right? We, now you're like, wait a minute, the Soviet Union. I'm like, yeah, look at the top of my screen. Look at the top of the, the slide. It's all the murder stuff. Yes, I totally know. But, and here's the thing. In the Soviet Union, there were too many groups that didn't want to give up power. There were too many groups that were allied with the way Stalin did things. And besides, the the Soviet Union was too hurt by World War II and the Cold War to really compete with the United States in the 50s and the 60s. The United States was the richest country. I don't know. People say in the history of the world, I don't know. But it was a good time. 1958 was a good time to be an American. 1961 was a good time to be an American. But in the Soviet Union, it was still poverty. It was still recovering from World War II, still recovering from Stalin. So they couldn't really compete on the world stage. You, you looked at the two countries and went, eh, I like the Ameri- what the Americans are doing is pretty good. But I want to point out that Khrushchev has a philosophical point he can argue. He just has to get the old school conservative hardliners to go along with it. He's got to get the reformers. He's got to change. He's got to make he's got to make the Soviet Union a nicer, uh, 
kinder place. And Russia's a hard place, man. I mean, I'm a Scandinavian historian, so I deal with Russia of the 1650s, 1680s, 1700s, right? It's hard. It's a hard people in a hard place. So not that much had changed. Like, smiley, happy people is not the Russian history. But it had to be. It had to change. Because you Eastern Europeans had to be kept in the system. China was, was Mao was becoming its own planet, was circling out. Of course, Mao was running his country into the ground, so it was kind of okay to let China go. But it you had to be different. You couldn't be the same. You couldn't just keep murdering people and sending them to the eastern Siberia. Except there were too many people who liked that idea. And so the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe in the 60s and the 70s, while you have the, the London of the 60s, right? You got the, the Austin Powers London, the, the swinging, swinging 60s, the swinging London. You get the hippies in America. You get the French, you know, being French in the 60s, right? It's new wave and revolution. It's all this kind of effervescence of youth and liberalism. Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union were increasingly becoming conservative, old, and isolated. Brezhnev and the conservative hardliners overthrow Khrushchev and his liberalism. Uh, they overthrow him for a couple of reasons. The Cuban Missile Crisis is one that was seen as a humiliation. Um, the, just the, the liberalism would, would have brought in a whole new generation of leaders. And we saw this with the with Mao. Mao wasn't going to give up power. Mao wasn't going to be pushed aside by a new generation. And so what happens is we get Brezhnev and the conservatives and they reinstate the Stalinist controls. They attack Eastern European socialism with a human face. That was the idea for Khrushchev. It was like, you have to be communist. But you can define your own communism. And so, like, the most famous of this, so there's this East Germany and this Hungary, but the most famous and the most liberal is the pra is Prague and Czechoslovakia. And what was known as the Prague Spring of 1968, where the Czech youth basically said, get the F out of our country. Like, there was a basic social revolution of, like, we want liberty. We didn't, they didn't want, they weren't arguing to be part of NATO. They weren't par arguing to be like, we're going to leave Warsaw. We just, let's, can we just have our own country back? We don't need to be occupied by you. And what happened is the Soviet Union invaded, brought in its tanks. So some of the most famous photos are the photos of the Czech youth surrounding these Soviet tanks. And it took a little while, kind of like Tiananmen Square, but and eventually they started shooting people. And that was the F your feelings. We don't care. And so communism was essentially dead in Eastern Europe. Instead, you had dictators and this new Russian empire. The idea that we'd be communists and we'll be together and we'll be wees and we'll be sharing and we'll... No, it was dead. It was just dictators, secret police like the Stasi, S-T-A-S-I, in East Germany, and just basically a new Russian empire. It wasn't the Soviets. It wasn't, you know, Ukrainians and Uzbeks. and Ka It's the Russians. The Russians are occupying Eastern Europe. So Eastern Europe becomes moribund economically, politically. It becomes a world in decline. I think, uh, I am a youth of the 80s, and I always think of East Berlin as gray and in the rain. I, I just do. I don't know why. Maybe it's the movies I saw in the 80s, but I always think of East Berlin as never having sunshine. Kind of the way people think of like 19th century England, uh, London, as having, uh, it's all fog. It's night and fog all the time. You know, that's just the image you get. 
the image I always have from like Genesis songs and Lou Reed songs and and movies is just that East Berlin just rained all the time. It was it was dark, dirty, and rainy just all the time, and nobody was on the streets. It's like like the Nighthawks that we saw, except rain. The USSR, on the other hand, the cost to maintain its empire, its nukes, invading Afghanistan to maintain the government there, to control Eastern Europe, to put down any revolt, grows. It becomes huge. It becomes much more expensive. The one thing Khrushchev had, the best part of his idea, whether you want to think it was a good idea or not, but the best part was it would limit the costs if people want to be communists then you didn't have to spend so much energy making sure they were communists. Do you see what I mean? Like, when Brezhnev comes in, he, and the dictators come in, and the conservative hardliners come in, they basically threw that out the window, which meant they had to force people, which means you have to have tanks and guns and people and bureaucracy and government and laws and and you constantly have to be in people's faces. It's way easier, and you know this from your parents, right? And from religion, it's way easier to get someone to want to act a good way. That they do it on their own, they self-police. That's way cheaper. That's not what's happening. The Stasi record every phone call made in their country, made in East Germany. They record everything, everything, which means someone's got to listen to it at some point as they archive all this stuff, right? That takes time and it's energy and it's, and most 99% of the time, it's people calling, you know, their, their, there's significant others saying, can you pick up some eggs and milk? I mean, it's just useless waste of time and energy and money. So the costs of maintaining their empire grow, become huge at a time when the economy is not keeping up. The economy can no longer produce. Well, could the Soviet Union have survived if they got reformers? Maybe. But instead, they got a su succession after Brezhnev of old geriatric conservatives, one after the other. I think they're three. And there's just no reform. And so the Soviet Union, economically, politically, morally, just goes into decline. Nobody wants to become a communist. No one's like, woo, the, the Communist Party in the United States just dies. The Communist Party in most of Western Europe just dies. They got socialism. They got health care. They got education. Like They got the nice things of communism without having to have the one-party dictatorship. So who wants to be part of the Soviet system? Whereas in the 30s, it was attractive because it was successful. By the 80s, it's a system that's fallen apart. It's clearly fallen apart. What's a good result of the Cold War? Well, the popular culture, clearly the movies, the books, the music, because they couldn't have been created at any other time. They are created in this pressure cooker of this conflict, Animal Farm, James Bond from Russia with love, do, 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 do. the anti-racism of Star Trek where you have a multi-ethnic, multicultural, you know, world of equality, where not only are people of different colors equal, but different species are equal throughout the universe. And there's a, a great story from Martin Luther King to Nichelle Nichols about when, when she wanted to leave Star Trek. He said, you can't, you have to stay because you represent equality on television. You don't have a black role. You have a role played by a black person. That's what we're fighting for. I'm just summarizing. You really should check out 
the different she has a couple different versions she's a long form, form version on youtube and then there's a the, the traditional short form version you should check them both out they're very interesting they're very enlightening about the pressures and the how hard it is to you had to put what you had to put what Nichelle Nichols did, what Jackie Robinson did, um, what was called in the day a race man, a race woman, um, what Rosa Parks did is you sacrificed yourself for the good of your race, for the advancement of your race. And so you did things that maybe you didn't want to do, maybe were inconvenient for you. I mean, John Lewis got cracked in the head. He got his he got his skull cracked open. The kids who went and sat at the lunch counters got hot coffee poured on them. That's not comfortable. That's torture. But they did it for the good of all people, all of black folk. And so it's very if you if you're interested in this at all, if you're interested in Star Trek, if you're interested in race and gender and equality and democracy, if you're interested in the '60s, check out Nichelle Nichols's videos. Um, there's Doctor Strangelove, which is a comedy about nuclear war. It's how absurd the Cold War is. The actor, Mr. Pickens riding the nuclear bomb down as if he's a cowboy. Right? The famous the famous joke when the, the men are fighting and they go, you can't fight here, men, gentlemen. This is the war room. You know? There's even uh, Bondarchuk's War and Peace, maybe the, the biggest movie ever made with more extras like, they fought actual, like, life-size battles in this War and Peace. It's the, it's the War and Peace is, of course, the Leo Tolstoy's great book about the, the Napoleonic invasion of Russia. But it's really, that's the background. It's really about a couple of different families. It's about the romance of Andre and Sonia. And not Andre with Sonia, that's. That's a whole different thing. Um, it's a Soviet movie about sacrificing for, for Russia to survive from the out from the Western invasion, right? So it's a very poignant movie to put in the Cold War. It wins an American Oscar for Best Foreign Picture. That's how good it is. It's so good. Even the Americans said, oh, you got to give this one an Oscar. I mean, um, if we don't say it's the best foreign picture made this year. I mean, that's how good it is. Rocky IV, look at the bodies of these men. These are not normal male bodies by any standard. They are boxer bodies looking like that. They are massive. These bodies, these Cold War bodies. The terrible result of the Cold War, that three generations, the World War II, the boomers, and the Xers, and the young, the oldest wires, you know, who are the old millennials now. I like to call them Generation Y. But those three generations grew up with death and trauma. They grew up, the World War II generation grew up with having the Depression, having won the war, and then immediately going into Korea. Immediately going into the Russians, the Soviets are the problem. And the nukes, the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? The boomers had Vietnam and a dozen other places. Xers had mass nuclear the day after, war games, Chernobyl, where even an accident could equal mass death. Swedes got cancer from Chernobyl, despite being a thousand miles away, 800 miles away, right? Movies, TV shows, the day after, your entertainment, you sat down with your TV dinner at eight o'clock on a Sunday night and watched shows 
that joked about, that talked about, that showed mass death. I, if you were watching the video, there's Bloom County. Bloom County had a whole series on a nuclear reactor accident. That's funny. It's a joke. And it's like, oh, you should have seen the, how the nuclear core just went right into the ground like a big glowing gopher. <laughs> and you're like, oh, my God. It's like joking about school shootings today. Like it's, 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 um, kind of a, uh, what is it called? A funeral humor. It's, um, the grave digger humor. It's, um, I can't think of it. I'm sorry, but it's, it's, you know, I tell this story in class and this is the, the story. I was a kid. I was in the eighties in the early eighties. Reagan was talking about nuking the Soviet union and, you know, which would, everyone knew would cause them to nuke us and kill everybody. We lived in the suburbs of New York that were uh, that were not part of New York City, so we we're not Brooklyn, we we're not Queens. We could see over Brooklyn and Queens from the my from the third floor of my elementary school from my third grade classroom. I could see planes going into Kennedy, into JFK, um, and I could see uh, the Twin Towers and the Empire State Building rising above Brooklyn and Queens. And I said to, I asked my father one time, I said, um, if the nuclear war starts, what are we going to do? And he said, we're going to get on the roof and we're going to watch. I was like, oh, that's pretty terrible. And he's like, where are we going to go? The highways will all be jammed. No one will be able to go anywhere. We're too close. Like, you, you know you could see New York. And I'm like, yeah. You know, I used to love watching the Concord when I was in the third, fourth, fifth grade. Those classrooms were all on the same New York facing side and I could, you could watch the Concord because it was different from every other plane that came into Kennedy and you watched the Concord come in. That was, that was cool. But we were going to watch a giant firework and then be obliterated by it because there was what, there was nothing else you could do. So, Dad, what happens if there's a nuclear war? Well, we die, son, but at least we'll get a hell of a light show. Like, that's the world we lived in. That trauma, that death, hanging over everything, every election, every conversation, every decision. What about Cold War culture and music? It was awesome, but sad and traumatic. Dylan's acoustic work, a hard rain's gonna fall. Masses of War. These were one long funeral song they were described as. Hard Rain is Gonna Fall. One long funeral song. Lou Reed Berlin about drugs and abuse and suicide and child trauma, childhood trauma, about abuse. Doctor Who, which was a kid's show. The doctor was democracy. The Daleks were fascism. With their exterminate, exterminate. The Cybermen were communism because everybody who got murdered by the cop, by the Cybermen became a Cyberman. You lost your identity. The Clash is London calling. Even the punks were angry at not controlling their own destiny. And the Clash and the Sex Pistols showed off a European notion of the Cold War, which was we're stuck between them. Like, no matter what we do, we don't define our own destiny. If the American president and the, and the Soviet premier get into a, 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 an argument over caviar, Europe will die. And so there was this anger that Europe was now a plaything of other people. Their lives were a rounding error in someone else's politics. And so that comes out in the songs of Genesis, in the clash and, you know, several of the songs on London calling, um, in the sex pistols, in the punks, the, you know, for an American case, it's the Ramones is a good example, but even pop music had all had that same thing of a, 
we we might as well do the best we can because we don't know how long we've got. There's always a pressure. You never had forever in 1980s culture. There was always a limit out there. Whether you expressed it, whether you stated it or not, it was always out there. You know, it, it's uh, the the best version of that is the t- is Iron Maiden's Two Minutes to Midnight. It's Two Minutes to Midnight because there's a clock. There used to be, there still is the atomic. Um, it's a clock that atomic scientists use to discuss how close we are to global thermonuclear war. And one of the things became like two minutes to midnight came one of the more famous phrases coming out of that. Like there was a clock counting down to humanity's execution. How do you live like that? So in in class, when we talked about this, I think the best way I can describe being like a kid in the eighties and living in this cold war is like, it's like now with gun violence, with school shootings, is it likely to happen? Probably not. Not today, but could it happen? Is it out there? Like this great Leviathan that will one day get you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've, I've made changes in the way I teach. I've made changes in the way I present myself. I made changes in my classes. So I don't have students angry at me just in case. Cause you never, I've had unhinged students. I've had students threaten me. I've had students threaten my job and you go, I don't want to be shot for a B. That's crazy. I lived through the 80s. I got through, I got past nuclear war and AIDS, man. I'm not going to be shot for a B. So, but it's, it's out there. It just lurks. And that's the Cold War. It's this background radiation to everything. So what happened to the Soviet Union in the 80s? Well, it collapsed. Which f- people thought might be good, but because of all the nuclear weapons, it could have been very terrifying. Um, the defeat in Afghanistan, the Russians did not want to hold on to Eastern Europe. There's no, there's no, there's no appetite for maintaining the empire in Eastern Europe. And the economic collapse meant that there wasn't, the economic collapse in the 80s meant the government wasn't able to impress people with its ability to get stuff done, which is the whole point of the Leninist, Stalinist system, was that the government will control things and it will get things done. Well, suddenly it was running out of bread. I remember watching like 60 Minutes and them having video of bread lines. Like, that's the thing that should never have happened in the Soviet Union. Like, they might not have cool, super new technology like Sony Walkmans and CD players. That everybody understood. But the basics you were supposed to have so much of because the government would provide it and provide it cheap. And they didn't have it. They didn't have milk, eggs, meat, steaks. The Soviet system couldn't make it. So they could not afford, by the mid-80s, peoples to maintain people's standard of living. So the economy could not make quality goods. And the politics could not accommodate change. So when Gorbachev begins reforms, the whole thread, the whole yarn, the whole sweater of the Soviet Union just frayed. It fell apart because it got pulled in all these different directions. Conservatives didn't want to change. Liberals wanted democracy. The Eastern Europeans wanted just to be free. They wanted just whatever they were going to do, they just didn't want the Soviets to tell them what to do, whether it was communism or democracy or capitalism or whatever it was. It was just going to be not Soviet troops in their country. Um, So there's the loss of the empire in Eastern Europe. And then that's in 1989. And then in in 1991, the Soviet Union, the largest country on earth, broke up into 15 parts. 
15 parts. So how did we get Putin? Well, because when the Soviet Union broke up, chaos ensued. Absolute effing chaos. Economic chaos. Privatization of state-owned businesses, i.e. capitalism, like we're going to have private owners of factories, of apartment buildings. Well, that all equaled economic trauma and collapse. Why? Because most of that wealth was looted by oligarchs. If the government owns, say, an apartment building, and now it's not going to own the apartment building, it's going to sell that apartment building, who gets to buy it? Is there going to be an auction? Is there a market? There's no stock market. Is there, who gets it? Well, a lot of the people who got it were either the black market, the mafia, or cronies. You know, someone in the housing authority, when the guy said, I don't know, uh, I got to sell these, these six apartment buildings that have 600 renters in them. Uh, Joey, you want them? Uh, sure. That's nice. How much is the, how much rent did I bring in? Uh, I don't know, like 1.2 million, you know, let's carry to one, 1.2 million dollars a year. You know, uh, I'll sell it to you for 50 bucks. Right, you croonies picked up stuff. Things just got looted. They just literally looted. The great mercenaries and arms dealers just walked into Soviet air bases and just loaded shit on planes and just left. Flew out with billions of dollars worth of Soviet military hardware. And they just took it to Africa. They took it to, to Pakistan. They just took it to North Korea, to whoever would pay. S the Soviet Union just exhaled s wealth that had been locked in. It wasn't invested. It ended up in Switzerland and the Grand Caymans. It ended up in, in mafioso uh, and drug uh, deals. It ended up in the Premier League and soccer leagues as these oligarchs tried to wash their money, whitewash their money, launder their money into legal enterprises. And so l apartment buildings, luxury apartment buildings in London and New York were huge. I remember living in New York and there was so much building and every advertisement for it was luxury apartments Luxury apartments starting at 10 million, starting at 15 million, starting at 22 million. I'm like, who has this kind of money? Like, you're building a hundred story apartment building. That's got to be a hundred to 150 people, give or take, 75 to 150 people, give or take how you lay it out, right? Who all, who have 20 million dollars laying around? who happened to want to live in New York? And it turned out, no, they were Russians who needed a place to store their money. Donald Trump made a lot of money doing this, but so did lots of people in New York. In fact, you, you, uh, I am not the biggest fan of the ex-president, but I will give credit where it's due. Lots of landlords, lots of building people sold. The money was there. The money was begging to be taken. Why wouldn't you take it? Why? It was there. So lots of people took Russian money. The London is completely overwhelmed with Russian money. Whether it's the soccer teams or the, the department stores or giant uh, luxury apartments, London is, you know... So the early 90s, people lost their dignity. They lost their quality of life. They lost the thing that the Soviet Union had given them, which was hope for the future. That was the promise. The promise was, you're not going to get freedom, but you'll be taken care of. You'll have a good future. The Soviet Union will take care of you, 
and the Soviet Union will provide for you. The Soviet Union will help you succeed. And you will help the Soviet Union succeed. Well, the Soviet Union was gone. And now there was nothing. There was no more education. There was no more uh, housing vouchers. There was no more anything. There was no hope for the future. And the most kind of interesting and famous version of the no hope for the future was the Russian mail-order brides. I mean, Nicole Kidman made a movie about being a Russian mail-order bride. The early internet, the early I mean, late night TV was like, you could buy yourself a Russian wife, a, which is essentially advertising on American TV for a sex slave. She gets a visa, you get a woman who's hot, who you get to have sex with. And they advertise that on late night TV and the early internet. And these women did not want to live in the Soviet Union anymore. But think about how awful that is. That they're like, well, I can stay in Russia or I can live in America, but I have to have sex with a desperate, gross guy who bought me. I'll pick, the, I'll pick that. I'll pick, at least I'll be in America. You know, it's like, how awful must Russia have been in 1996? 1998. And so you get Putin. Why? Because he promises he can fix it. He's an old school KGB, you know, by the numbers, run it hard, hard as nails, right? He's a man of the people. Which may say me seem seem crazy, but look, he has the he's riding horseback with his shirt off, right? Just like Rocky IV, right? Just like Donald Trump on the Trump flag, where his body is changed into Rambo's body. Remember that he's Putin's doing it in real life. He's a real life cartoon villain or cartoon character. He's playing on the hockey team, right? The national sport. He goes on TV. And has a call-in show every year, which is hours long. It's not like he gets on there, he does 20 minutes and he leaves. He does hours and people call him and go, my rent's too high. And he goes, great, give me the number of your landlord. He calls up the landlord and says, lower the rent. And he, the person goes, okay, because you're going to say no to Putin? Of course not. You know, Putin has a whole bunch of cronies. who like an like a, a old Tammany Hall machine politician who he says fix that fix this fix that fix that and that's the whole point of the uh, of the of the annual colon show now to give putin his due that's the way the old byzantine emperors acted that's the way an old roman emperor would act that's the way marcus aurelius acted that they had to be available to the people. In fact, that's the way old presidents acted. You see that in Lincoln, where there's all these people in the White House waiting for a moment. They're waiting in line. They're arguing. They're pushing each other. But they're waiting for a moment to sit down with the president. You can't do that today. I can't just wait at the White House and then say, hey, Mr. President, give me five. I get five minutes. But it used to be that way. In the United States. So it's not just for show is the point. There's a long history of it that he's tapping into. But he's a man of the people. And who is he? He's against Russian oligarchs. He's against the USA. And he's against liberal change, especially the gays, the trans, the the the, the women, the feminists. The, the people who want to change the world in a way that, you know, old school dudes just don't want to happen. The old folk don't want to happen. That the church doesn't want to happen. And in exchange for that, he steals billions of dollars worth of stuff. He murders his opposition, mostly by pushing them out. Mostly by pushing them out of windows. The amount of opposition people or journalists who suddenly fall out of a 15-story window right? Or get poisoned by nuclear reactor waste, you know, stuff like that. It's like, this stuff doesn't happen in a normal place. Why? Because he's sending a message. It's like the mafia in New York with the two shots to the back of the head. 
you know, it used to be, I remember I'd be listening to the radio and I'd be listening to radio news and it's like, and uh, Joey Gambino has been, was murdered today in an ex mafia execution style. And it went, you got two, you got two shots in the back of the head. But the economy stabilized mostly because of the oil, the price of oil. The oligarchs got humbled. These guys who are plundering the economy, they got humbled. And so if you're a regular Russian, you go, good for them. Good. These guys sucked. Right? So there's stability, but there's no wealth. There's no freedom. The life in Russia is not getting better. In fact, it's getting worse. Russia has the lowest male life expectancy in Europe. 65 years, which is lower than an African-American male in the United States. Think about that. The Russian majority masculine population has a lower life expectancy than the oppressed, racially um, hindered and impoverished minority male in the United States. In a place that does not have universal health care, the United States, in a place that has no guarantee that, that everything is, is based on the amount of wealth that you have, and most black folk on average are far, far poorer than white folk, that makes no sense. That Russian male life expectancy would be lower than African-American male life expectancy. And yet it is. That's how bad it is. And it's going to be keep going down, whether it's alcoholism, suicide. The war in Ukraine is going to kill hundreds of thousands of Russian men, which is why they're using prisoners. I mean, at the point you're using prisoners, at the point you're using prisoners, you are at the end of your available man manpower. So you get Putin because Putin, People were traumatized by the move towards capitalism. And he said, I'll control it. I will fix it. I'll beat up the people you don't like. I will, I will control the economy so it will, it will at least not hurt you. But I'm going to steal a lot of money. And I'm going to get effing rich. And you're not going to have freedom. And your life isn't going to get better. But it won't get worse. And for going on 20 years or so, people, the Russian people said, okay. What is the end of history? Well, the end of history is a philosophical concept that derives from Hegel in the 19th century. Uh, it's most famously recently in the, in the 1990s book, The End of History and the Last Man by Francis Fukuyama. It's the idea that all evolution is moving towards a platonic endpoint. The idea that they're that there would be all governments, all political systems will end somewhere. They're all moving towards something. So that all human evolution was going towards the homo sapien, us. That shark evolution ends, ends with the great white shark, right? The, the sharks you have today. Because they really haven't evolved much in whatever it is, 300 million years. So it's the idea that there's a point at which you go, hey, this is the best political system, economic system we could have. This is it. This is where we all should be. And then the, and so the, after the Cold War, it was the idea that competition for political development was over. Liberal capitalist democracy had won. Monarchies had failed in the 19th and early 20th century. Fascism had blown itself up and murdered lots of people. And the communism finally failed. The only government left standing that had any popular legitimacy was democracy. And so the idea of the end of history was that we would reach a point where basically every political system on earth would be somewhere between the conservative American corporation first model and the kind of left-leaning the leftist, I should say, Scandinavian redistributive model. They would all have voting, human rights, equality, 
capitalism. It would just be how much regulation that you have, how much government involvement would you have, but it would be liberal democratic capitalism. Just pick a flavor. You know, on the on the right, conservative, United States, Britain, you know, Japan, South Korea. On the left, Scandinavia, Italy, France. So um, that was the idea. And remember, the, the idea was that China would become democratic because as their people got richer, they'd want more rights. That uh, without communism as a viable alternative, people would just want to be democratic. They'd want rights. They'd want to vote. They'd want to have a say. And that was, I, I did a report to, in my grad school, grad school 101. I was asked to, to review the end of history. And I came along, came away going, there's some interesting ideas here. I got laughed at. But it's like, like, uh, you know, historians thinking about the end of history. But I'm like, that's not, like, that's the whole point of the, the title is to be provocative. But that's not what he's saying. It's not like the end of things will happen. It's that the world has figured out that the best system is a democratic capitalist system. There, there wasn't an alternative in 1998. You know, dictatorships didn't have popular legitimacy. People don't like mostly living under dictators. And so the idea was eventually will everybody will live in this democratic capitalist system. The problems with the end of history that we should have foreseen more um, but didn't appreciate as much in the 90s when we were talking about a unipolar world, a single superpower. You know, the USS, the USA was the sole superpower of the world. Was that, interestingly, the rise of conservatism. See, the liberal capitalist system is fairly liberal in its culture. It wants more people to vote. It wants more people to participate. It wants more freedoms. It wants more democracy. It's liberal in its, it's, you know, like French Revolution, American Revolution, you know, thinking about liberty. And so the thing that we kind of didn't foresee, and we should have because it was already there, was the rise of different forms of conservative backlash. Militant Islamic terrorism, first in Al-Qaeda and then ISIS. This, uh, the idea that a male theocratic system would replace a multi-ethnic democracy. You could be any, re any religion you want, as long as you're ours. That kind of idea. That militant Islamic terrorism had an appeal and, you know, when it's Al-Qaeda and Hamas and Hezbollah, it's not that big of an appeal. But ISIS showed it could be a, it could make a nation. It could be a large appeal and it could bring in more and more people, people who were already living in the West, people who were living a liberal democratic life and didn't like it. There's also the authoritarian capitalism. The idea that you didn't need communism and that the, the opposite of communism or the replacement of communism wasn't liberal capitalism, that it was an authoritarian capitalism where the government maintained control of the economy, but its resources were more distributed, I guess. But that's China. That's Putin's Russia. The economy is not communist. But it's not really free market either. That economic success, you, get, you could have economic success and not democracy. That people in China, in Russia, in different places, Hungary right now, would say, okay, but what I really want is a dictator to protect me or to help me or I don't want to have to have a say. Because if I have a say, democracy tells me all these other people I don't like get to have a say. 
and I don't want them to have a say. So I'm going to elect a guy who's going to beat up the people I don't like and just help me. This kind of authoritarian capitalism. And then in the United States and Europe, the kind of rise of neo-fascism, of white supremacy, of the idea of a conservative, masculine rejection of multi-ethnic, multi-gender equality. Make America 1953 again. Right? That I mean, and you see it not only in America, though that's the Proud Boys and that's a, a bunch of these groups that assaulted the Capitol on January 6th. But it's also political parties, conservative political parties. The, the fascist, racist party in France got 40-something percent of the vote. Came in second. Macron won, but not as big of a win as you would think when you go, my opposition are Nazis. And go, well, they're not real Nazis. They're French Nazis. And go, okay, what about the Swedish party, the Swedish fascist party, which comes from real Nazis? They came in first. They had the second largest party in the recent elections, but they won. So that's Hungary again. Italy has a woman in charge of basically a fascist party. And so there's this idea that in France, in Sweden, in Italy, in liberal places, that there's a rejection, of especially of African or Middle Eastern migration, of immigration, just like there is of South American or Central American immigration in conservative America. That there's this conservative masculine rejection of multi-ethnic, multi-gender equality. That was there. All of that was there. The attack on the blowing up in, in Oklahoma City of the federal building. It's Oklahoma, it's Oklahoma, right? Oklahoma City. That happened before Francis Fukuyama's book came out. Before I studied it, anyway. Before 9-11. And so that this conservative male masculine rejection of a more equal, more feminized, more multi-gendered, multi-ethnic, multi-racial uh, system, people thought that would just fade away, I guess. I guess I did. You know, so and here we are now we've had elections in many countries of people who just say they're going to hurt minorities in their country. They're going to throw out immigrants. They're going to get rid of, quote unquote, illegal immigrants or people without documents. They're going to make their country great again by making it whiter or more European than it was. And so that's one of the big, that's a, that, that is a rejection of the liberal capitalist democratic system, a kind of minoritarian um, dictatorship. And so thank you. We've made it to the end of the course. Woo! We made it to like 2010, man. That's awesome. Uh, but man, that's a downer. I ended up with, you know, white supremacy and dictatorships. And so we're going to have a one more fun lecture, right? So next up, the last lecture, our coda, is going to be world cinema and Disneyland's around the world. So that we don't end on mass murder and nuclear war. We end on a happy note of Igmar Bergman of Bollywood and of Disney Sea and Tokyo Disneyland and and Hong Kong Disneyland and and uh, Mickey Mouse around the world. So take care, be safe, and I'll see you in the next and last episode.